today we are going to talk about approximate dynamic programming i guess we are meeting after 2 weeks so hopefully you won't remember well, not hopefully but uh, i'm guessing you won't remember what we discussed in the previous class so we were talking about dynamic programming so we talked about maximum principle for solving dynamic optimization problems then we talked about dynamic programming the difference was maximum principle gives you optimal open loop control dynamic programming gives you optimal closed loop control um uh, strategy and uh one thing we learned from dynamic programming uh algorithm is that the storage requirement as well as the computation requirement is too high for running dynamic programming algorithms so and this is not a new thing this is something that was recognized back in 1950s itself so except for very simple dynamic optimization problems like the ones we did on the board um dynamic programming is very very difficult to implement in practice for real system so you typically resort to uh either computing open loop control so that way you open loop control uh again and again after every 100 milliseconds or after every 10 milliseconds so that you don't have to do dynamic programming so that's how a lot of systems are controlled or you run dynamic programming for uh systems where uh you don't really have to run real time you don't have to implement that algorithm in real time so for instance if you are uh one situation where dynamic programming is helpful is if you are running a very large hvac system heating ventilated ventilation and cooling system uh for very large universities so there the thermal inertia is such that you can do the computation in at much faster time scale than the actual um heating and cooling decisions that you need to make for large buildings or or a set of a group of buildings uh nonetheless uh this fact is uh, apparent that dynamic programming still requires uh, i mean we would like to use dynamic programming for many many problems but uh we don't quite have the computational tools to solve the problem in real time and we would like to do that so a lot of people over the past 50 or so years have developed a lot of techniques related to approximate dynamic programming which is i don't want to compute the optimal strategy i'm happy with a suboptimal strategy and the question is how do we compute a suboptimal strategy so a heuristic so a suboptimal strategy is strictly better than a heuristic which is strictly better than just controlling aimlessly right uh so we would so controlling aimlessly was the norm for a long time which is just make sure that the system is up and running it doesn't matter how much the emission is it doesn't matter how much it is polluting doesn't matter how much resource it is consuming as long as it works and it it moves people around or it it does whatever it's supposed to do we are completely fine so the coal engines made in the 1850s were working coal engines but it used to spew a lot of emissions in the air unburned carbon particles and so on I don't know how many of you know about London smog of 1850s and 60s and a lot of people died or at least uh, it made big headlines at that particular point of time because the emission standards were pretty much unknown at that time and they were just systems running with no optimization whatsoever in mind and of course then came uh, uh the recent time where fuel became expensive you wanted to make sure that the environment is clean and so on and people came up with heuristic and using heuristics they could control some of these emissions and then came the era of dynamic programming which is started in around 1950s where you could actually compute the truly optimal strategy at least a theoretical framework to compute the truly optimal strategy and now we are looking into approximate dynamic programming so that you can actually implement it in practice on real systems so <clears throat> remember if you remember dynamic programming has two steps the first step is to compute the optimal strategy at a specific uh state xt is argmin of u of gt 
एक्स टी यू टी और प्लस वी टी प्लस वन एफ टी एक्स टी यू टी ओके सो यू नीड टू कंप्यूट द पॉलिसी एंड यू नीड टू कंप्यूट द वैल्यू सो दैट यू कैन प्रॉपरगेट इट बैकवर्ड्स दैट इज द मिन ओवर यू टी of the same thing <clears throat> and the problem is we need to compute arg min okay so run gradient descent for infinite number of times in order to compute the arg min and once you compute the arg min you have to evaluate it to compute the min and compute the value function and this value function will then be used to compute gamma star t minus 1 and so on right that's the basic idea of dynamic programming algorithm which follows from a bellman's principle of optimality now um now there are multiple problems when you think about implementing it so the problems could be t is very large so in a vehicle if you are controlling or sending control commands every 100 milliseconds uh and your actual system is going to run for i don't know when i used to go to pittsburgh it would take 3 hours so that's 180 minutes so you can do the calculation if i compute every 100 milliseconds for a horizon length of 180 minutes you can imagine how many how many uh, what the value of t would be in that particular situation of the order of 20000 plus maybe even 100000 i don't know okay so t is very large second is storing vt third is storing gamma star t <coughs> okay and of course the fourth is computing vt and gamma star t <coughs> okay so these are the four major issues with running a dynamic programming algorithm um this doesn't include uh, another form of approximation that needs to be done if you had uncertainty in the future so if you had a noise variable here then you have to do something else and since we haven't talked this is all about deterministic optimization so far i'm not including the part where you have uncertainty but if you had uncertainty in the future states which involved expectations of the future value function then you also have to worry about uh computing expectations computing expectations on future values okay so this is the case in the stochastic setting okay uh we haven't really touched upon the fifth subject so i guess i'm not going to talk much about that but uh, we will talk about the first four points any questions so far okay so let's consider the first problem where t is very large and i want to come up with an approximate way to do the optimal control what would your first line of attack would be what would you like to do my t is of the order of 100000 if t is 100000 i can't be storing all the gamma star and v star for 100000 time steps and uh, compute the optimal control strategy for every point of time 
So what would you like to do? What would you? Sorry? A small horizon of time. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, so you compute it for say 100 seconds? Just 100 seconds? Yes. Okay. And then you recompute it for the next 100 seconds and so on. Okay. Yeah. So if your t is of the order of 1 million or 100,000, uh, we don't really want to solve the entire 100,000 time step problem. What we will do is solve only 100, 10, 10, 15, 20, 100 step problem and then reuse that computation again and again at every point of time. So that approach is known as L step. So this is L step look ahead policy. Okay. So let's look at what L step look ahead policy attempts to do. So, what he mentioned, what your colleague mentioned, is a kind of L step look ahead policy which is just look at 100 time steps or 50 time steps. But let's see what L step look ahead policy means. So here is the idea. In order to compute gamma star of xt, all I need to have is an expression for vt plus 1. Okay. So in order to compute now, of course, vt plus 1 could be a very complicated function, but even an, approximately comp uh, even an approximation of vt plus 1 will get us to an approximately optimal solution. So your original vt may look like this, but if instead I approximate it, so this is my original vt, I approximate it with something like this, it will give me an approximately optimal solution, okay? as long as this is a good approximation of the value function. So how do you get a good approximation of the value function? So there are multiple ideas. Uh, so that's why I wrote approximating the value function. So one idea of approximating this value function Vt is to Um, to compute a function j which is, so this is your um, j tilde t. So the idea, the, the essential idea is I compute an upper bound I compute an upper bound on Vt and use that to compute the optimal control strategy. Okay, So create an upper bound of Vt plus 1, plug it in here in this expression, get a suboptimal strategy for the problem. Okay, That's one step look ahead because you're approximating Vt plus 1 and then plugging it in here and then computing the optimal solution. Uh, but there is no reason why you should only approximate the next the value function at the next time step. I could approximate the value function L time steps later and then uh, use the L step look ahead policy. So in that case, gamma star t of xt would be argument gt plus gt plus 1 plus gt plus L minus 1 plus j tilde t plus l. Okay, so you add the cost for l time steps or l minus 1 time steps plus the terminal cost which is computed using some sort of approximation of the value function and 
solve this problem using dynamic programming to get gamma star t of xt. Yes. So this this running cost is always given, right? You know what the running cost of your system is going to be. So you know how much fuel will get consumed by your vehicle when you're running it on the road, right? Uh, these kind of maps have to be provided for your optimization problem to work. Okay, so is the idea clear? Now one approximation could be, I just pick this to be equal to zero. So my J tilde T plus L is equal to zero, and that's the rolling horizon control. So rolling horizon T plus L is equal to zero. Okay, so in L step look ahead policy or limited look ahead policy, you approximate a value function downstream for your optimization problem and then recompute the optimal solution using dynamic programming for a much simpler problem. Um, or you could just put the terminal cost as zero and just solve this particular problem, okay? And that's called a rolling horizon algorithm. Uh, any what do you think would be a drawback of rolling horizon problem or a limited look ahead policy, L step look ahead policy? So let's, let's, let's not think about this. What would be a problem with rolling horizon policy where your terminal cost is zero? Yes. So in the argument, uh, are you using MT for like uh, L steps? Yes, so you will use dynamic programming to solve this entire optimization and get the argument of ut. Function of ut plus one, yeah. So you have to run dynamic programming all the way. Well, so this is argument over ut, but actually, ut plus one, ut plus two, ut plus l minus one of this whole thing. Okay, so you minimize over the entire sequence of actions that you are going to take in the future. Okay, so going back to the question, what's the problem with rolling horizon algorithm? Terminal cost is equal to zero. Okay, so let's give, let, let, let us consider an example. Uh, how many of you have played Super Mario? Only a few? What's wrong with the class? <laughs> okay, so you know most of these video games, uh, when you are playing it, there, is, there are stages and you need to clear stage one to get to stage two, you need to clear stage two to get to stage three. And within each stage, you can earn rewards, okay? So in the case of Super Mario, you could jump and you could collect coins on the way, right? And then you have to complete the stage in order to get to the next stage. The real problem in Super Mario is get to the higher and higher stages. Collecting coins is just something you do for fun, okay? It didn't really affect you in any way. Uh, at least in my experience, it didn't affect me in any way. Uh, so. In the case of rolling horizon algorithm, let's say you are running a rolling horizon algorithm where you want to uh, maximize your reward, okay, in the entire process. Remember that in that particular game, the goal is to get to the destination, right? So any point that gets you closer to the destination should have higher value. However, if you use rolling horizon, your future cost is, or future reward is going to be zero. 
And what will end up happening if you solve this problem, what will end up happening is that Super Mario will just continue collecting coins without actually getting to the end of the stage, right? Um, and that's because Rolling Horizon does not discriminate, or rather the terminal cost does not discriminate between favorable states states and unfavorable states. Okay, so getting closer to the end of a particular uh, stage is a favorable state, but if you are just stuck at the very beginning and collecting coins by jumping, uh, that's an unfavorable state, right? You want to get to the end of the stage. So if you're using a rolling horizon where the terminal cost is set to zero, you're essentially not discriminating between favorable states where you want to be and unfavorable states where you're collecting reward but it's not really leading to ending of a particular stage. Okay, so that's the problem with rolling horizon algorithm. So of course, uh, that's why having a good uh, terminal cost is really important. Otherwise, you will do absurd thing uh, in order to, um, in, in the case of rolling horizon. So another example I could think is, let's say you have a situation where you want to minimize uh, the distance between a terminal, time, uh, a terminal state and a particular point. So if you want to go from here to Mars, you want to get at a specific position, at a specific coordinates on Mars, and you don't have any running cost. You are in space, the fuel costs nothing. I mean, you don't have to put in fuel and stuff. Uh, if you use a rolling horizon algorithm, then the terminal cost will not be seen in your rolling horizon algorithm, and therefore you will end up doing nothing to control the spacecraft and get to the specific point in Mars. Okay, so again, that is a situation where the terminal cost is not discriminating between favorable states and unfavorable states. So that's really a key drawback of rolling horizon algorithm. So it favors, in other words, rolling horizon favors short-term success over long-term success. Okay, so the third algorithm, which is a very important class of algorithm, is rollout algorithm. And this algorithm was developed in the context of the Deep Blue project, you know, the IBM project in 1990s to defeat the world champion in chess. Uh, so rollout algorithm was developed, well, it was specifically named at that particular point of time, but perhaps the idea was there in the literature even before that. And the idea is as follows uh, for the rollout algorithm. Okay, I am in this L-step look-ahead policy. I want to minimize the total cost plus the terminal cost, but how do I get terminal cost? Well, after time t plus L, I'm going to use a heuristic to compute the terminal cost, okay? So in other words, J tilde t, let's say, a heuristic policy a heuristic policy mu mu 0 mu 1 new capital T. Okay, it's a heuristic policy and I'm going to compute J tilde T plus L of X T plus L as G T plus L X T plus L mu T plus L X T plus L plus gt plus l plus 1 
x t plus l plus 1 mu t plus l plus 1 yeah so when you, when you say you're saying that just some vague estimate of what the terminal cost would be it's a vague estimate of what the terminal well it is exactly equal to the cost under that heuristic okay now what does that mean so let's say i drive on the road and an autonomous car company figured out how i drive on the road okay and that's a heuristic policy for the autonomous car company right so they they see that i observe all the cars around me and when do i brake when do i uh, accelerate uh, when do I change my gear and things like that. So they figured everything out. So that's a heuristic policy. And they want to optimize the driving of autonomous car. They want to make it smoother, much more smoother than how I drive. So they are going to assume, they're going to consider this problem where J tilde T plus L will be considered using my driving strategy and then use the onboard computer to compute the optimal strategy using a L-step look-ahead policy. In like the, the reinforcement learning framework, is that heuristic, like uh, your estimate of like, a, so say you have like a reinforcement learning that's like trying to learn how to play chess or something, right. is that like your estimation of the probability you're going to win, is that heuristic? Um, that yes, right. that's pretty yeah. much what, yeah, that's pretty much what they do. Okay. So they basically in the, uh, so we are departing from the discussion, but the way they do, they used it in chess is they had some heuristics as to how a normal human player would play under this particular board condition. So this is the configuration of the board, so where the pieces are and all that stuff. And so how would a human player play? And they would run some Monte Carlo simulations. So this is one sample path, this is another sample path, this is another sample path. And they would collect it and have a terminal cost to that particular state, okay? So, and this terminal cost will then be improved upon by an exhaustive search by the computer, right? So that's, that's why it's, no, it's called a rollout algorithm because you will roll a dice and you will figure out how a human player would play, you know, at various stages. So of course, each human could take one of the two options so they will themselves roll a die in order to figure out what you should do. And that's how they will come up with a scoring rule for each of the terminal states. And then they will come up with an optimal strategy of how to. So that's, that's, that's the reason why it's called a rollout algorithm. That's how it was named. Okay, so um, in one particular problem that we are looking at, we have implemented rollout algorithm in the following manner. So we have an autonomous car where the goal is to minimize the fuel consumption. But of course, like I mentioned, we need to control every 100 milliseconds. But the overall horizon length is of the order of 10,000 seconds. So we have the current cost for the next 10 seconds. And then the terminal cost is computed under no traffic setting. Okay, So it's a completely deterministic setting where we know exactly how the entire road is going to look like after 20 or 10 seconds. And we use uh, no traffic conditions and optimal driving strategy under no traffic condition as the heuristic and compute the optimal strategy for driving in a situation when there is traffic on the road, okay? So that's another instance of a rollout algorithm. So you need to have a heuristic, a good heuristic, and you can use that heuristic to compute the terminal cost in a limited look ahead uh, policy and get an optimal, approximately optimal control. Uh, the key theorem of rollout algorithm is it improves upon the heuristic. Cost attained through heuristic policy. Okay, so you, you strictly improve your heuristic policy if you use a rollout algorithm. Uh, sometimes it's dramatic improvement.
OK. So this is, uh, these are the three algorithms to address this T is very large <coughs> class of problems. Now how about storing VT? Uh, I have a state space that is very high dimensional. Uh, and I can't really store VT for every value of XT throughout the state space. So how do I store VT? So what would you do? You have to store a function on a computer. And it has to be stored for every value of XT. How would you do it? Neural networks? Uh, reduce the uh, dimension of XT by using something like a PCA. OK, so identify features in the XT, and then reduce the dimension of XT. But the problem is, even if you reduce the dimension of XT, you still have to store a function at all possible values within that lower dimensional space. So. OK, so that's another heuristic where you don't really store it for all possible values of x, but only for some values of x. Like the yeah, and so you can do a linear approximation or a quadratic approximation to do that. OK, uh, that's an idea. Uh, what else? So one person said neural network. Another person said reduce the dimension. Another person said. What did you say? Oh, do linear interpolation among different points in the space. So all of this basically points to one direction, which is uh, have a function approximating class for VT. OK? So pick VT from a class of functions. I, I shouldn't say pick VT, but approximate VT approximate VT from a class of functions. OK? So what kind of functions can you pick? So you can have neural networks. with 10 layers and 20 perceptrons. In each layer. So that's one function approximating class. OK, you can have any number of layers and any number of perceptrons in each layer. And that gives you a function approximating class. And you can approximate the VT by picking an appropriate function from this particular class. Uh, you could have sum of, of Gaussians, Gaussian kernels, which is summation of, um, summation of AI exponential minus norm of bi norm of x square and i equals 1 to capital N. So you need to identify appropriate parameters ai and bi um, in order to approximate the function with this class of functions. OK? Uh, you can have random uh, features. What is it called? Random. Random kitchen sinks. So let me write down the approximating class, and hopefully that will make it clear. Summation of AI sine of XI. Uh, sine of F of XI, no. F is already used. Uh, what can I use? F, G, H, phi, phi of x. 
Okay, so pick appropriate functions phi i, uh, pick appropriate weights a i, uh, i goes from 1 to n. And you pick an appropriate function from this class in order to approximate the value function. Okay? So there are many, many function approximating class. In fact, the whole field of machine learning thrives on coming up with cool function approximating classes, right? Uh, and you can pick the value function from that class of function. So I want to give you a picture of what is act actually happening when you do something like this. So this is the space of all value functions. Okay, so this is a function space, space of all value functions. Let's pick neural networks with 10 layers and 20 perceptrons. Uh, those functions are something like this in this space of functions. So this is the space of V, space of V from X to R, and this is the uh, neural networks with 10 layers and 20 perceptrons in each layer. So this is the functions that you can approximate using neural network. These are the functions you can approximate by sum of Gaussian. These are the class of functions you can approximate by this third class. So sine uh, set of functions. And this is your VT. Okay. So now you can imagine, initially the problem was how do you store VT? Uh, now it boils down to storing the weights of the neural networks or the weights of this Gaussian kernel, so AIs and BIs from 1 to N. And in this case, AIs and PHIs, and PHIs will be very simple functions again from 1 to n. So you have reduced considerably the uh, storage requirement for approximating VT. And your VT is here, so if you use a neural network training algorithm to approximate VT, maybe you will get your J tilde T here. If you use the sum of Gaussians to approximate VT, you might get J tilde T here. And if you use the sum of uh, sine functions, you might get some j tilde t here. Okay, so you have three possible values of j tilde t uh, to approximate v t using one of these classes. And naturally, all three of them will give you very different optimal policies. And hopefully, one of them will work better, so you can pick that particular class of functions and use that for your optimization problems. So this is the key idea of how do you address the storing of VT, uh, which is use a function approximating class to get an approximate value of VT and use that for your dynamic programming or use that for your L-step look-ahead policy to implement things in real time. So remember, when I was talking about the uh, resource allocation problem, I talked about the fact that the value function has a logarithmic function. And it basically said that you don't have to look at any of these uh, function approximating class. In that particular case, just look at ai ln x. And you just have to store ai in your computer to store the value function. Right, so it, re it strictly improved uh, the storage requirement by understanding in what class the function, the value function lies. So that was for the example. Example in the class. Now if I gave you that example and I asked you to use neural network to find the optimal policy, um, it wouldn't do as well as it would do if you had used a logarithmic uh, class of functions to approximate the value function. 
Okay, so that's why picking the right approximating class is a skill in itself that one needs to develop if one is uh, applying approximate dynamic programming techniques. Okay, same thing happens for storing gamma star t. You can use any of these function approximating class to store the policy as well, except that the output of the policy will be ut, and in case of vt, the output of the policy, output of the function approximating class has to be r. So I want to write it here. Vt goes from x to r, gamma star t goes from x to u. <clears throat> Any questions so far on approximate DP? So computing VT and gamma star T, I mean typically you will use gradient descent or similar techniques to do this argmin. Uh, some of the things you can try is using warm start which is use the previous solutions to as initial condition for your next set of solutions, or next set of gradient descent. So that allows you to simplify the, simplify the computation. Uh, since you have already computed the optimal policy in the past, so you can use that to initialize a new set of policies. So that addresses this case. For the fifth one, you use computer simulation, so we don't want to get into that, because right now we haven't talked about stochastic optimization problems. So Let's leave it for a future time. In fact, uh, in the EC8851, this will be one of the major topics. I mean, we will talk about all of these issues in EC8851 in much more detail. So I know some of you have registered for that. So uh, it will be based primarily on whatever we are going to talk about today. Any questions so far? OK. So we talked about rollout algorithm. Uh, let me expand a little bit on rollout now. Uh, so in the case of rollout, I mentioned that we have one heuristic and we computed the optimal cost using that heuristic, not the optimal cost. We computed the cost attained using that heuristic and then we applied the L-step look ahead policy. So the example scenario that you may want to consider is I'm driving the car, somebody collects all the data of how I drive the car in various settings, and use that to compute the look ahead cost. Now, there's no reason to believe that I have the best heuristic policy. Uh, maybe I don't drive very well in the dangerous setting, so you need someone else to drive, someone who is, who is good at driving in dangerous situations. I know many of you are. <laughs> So, uh, so the idea is you could collect multiple heuristics. There's no reason to believe that there's only one heuristic and you can use that to compute the terminal cost. So what do you do if you have data from five people driving a car in various situations? How would you compute the terminal cost in that case? Yeah. Yeah, so you could do weighted or you could even do minimization over all five different heuristics. So you have rollout with k heuristics. So you compute, oh, k is already used. What should I use? M, have you used M so far? Not really. M heuristic. So you compute JK plus L uh, one, JK plus L M, and then you use J tilde K plus L equals to min of So you have multiple heuristics, 
you can compute the terminal cost with respect to each of those heuristics, take the minimum, take the weighted average, or do uh, whatever other technique you want to use to simplify your L-step look-ahead policy. Okay. <clears throat> so that brings me to the uh, to the final topic, which is for this particular deterministic situation, which is how do these people uh, have trained these chess playing softwares or Go playing softwares? So it's a combination of rollout algorithm, L-step look-ahead policy, some amount of simulation, which we haven't covered, but we'll hopefully cover, uh, and approximating the value function as well as approximating the policy gamma using neural networks, okay? And these neural networks are, have large number of layers, large number of perceptrons in each layer, uh, and that has allowed them to develop much better systems who have defeated, uh, you know, game playing systems who have defeated world champions. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, Google DeepMind is one of the forerunners in this area, and they are now training uh, uh, their algorithms to play, what is this game, StarCraft? or? Some, some such game, right? So StarCraft or something like that. Uh, to, to play such games, and again, they are going to skillfully use all of these techniques that you see on the board. In a very, very uh, skillful manner, they are gonna use these techniques to learn how to play such games. So underlying all these game playing softwares are these uh, techniques in approximate dynamic programming. Uh, we'll definitely talk more about it in the, in the reinforcement learning class that I'm teaching next semester. Uh, we will perhaps go over all these topics again in that particular class and see how, what kind of function approximating class one could use to approximate the value function and the policy function. Uh, one of the things I want to note here is that New, there are some function approximating classes that are known as universal function approximators, which means any continuous function can be approximated by functions in that particular class. So neural networks has one such property. So if you have any Lipschitz continuous function, so if your value function was Lipschitz continuous, you can come up with a neural network which could have a large depth and a large number of perceptrons in each layer to approximate the function as closely as you want, okay? But nobody knows how much depth and how many perceptrons you need in each layer. So that's really the key challenge. And a lot of these, uh, uh, these people um, who are implementing these algorithms, they play around with the number of layers and number of perceptrons and so on to um, get the best approximation of VT for their particular application. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Uh, in the next class, we are going to talk about news vendor problem and introduce stochastic optimization techniques. Um, and that's what we'll talk about on Friday. Thank you.